Hi, uh, welcome to uh, the Brown Bag Lunch Training Series, a training series on health and policy topics affecting children and youth with special health care needs in California. Our presentations are geared towards families, professionals, parent-to-parent -parent staff, youth, and anyone else interested. Um, today's topic is Understanding Service Delivery Models for Physical and Occupational Therapy, an overview of PT and OT service models. We welcome a panel of really knowledgeable folks from San Diego to today, um, and I'll introduce them in a second, but at first I wanted to give you a few notes about the technology if you've never used a webinar before. Um, unless you're absolutely sure that you have a headset with a microphone that allows you to speak through your computer, you'll either need to call in or type in your questions um, when it's time for questions. You can find the call-in number from the confirmation email you have, or while you're connected, you can go to the audio menu, select Use Telephone, and it'll give you a dial-in and an access code and an audio pin and all that jazz. Um, please remember to enter in the audio pin. And then if you have any additional technical difficulties, you can call GoToWebinar directly. They're pretty good at helping people get up and running quickly. Um, their number is 1-800-263-6317. You can also send me, Tara Robinson, a chat or a question. Um, owing from feedback issues, we uh, generally have everyone on mute at first. Um, so when there are time for question, when it's time for questions, and the presenters have asked you um, if you have any questions, there's a little hand icon on the control panel, which is a small column on the left of the menu. It's a little hand with an arrow. If you click that, we know you want to be unmuted and you have a comment or question. Um, but remember, if you can't speak through your computer, um, you're not going to be. We're not going to be able to unmute you. So if you have any trouble being heard, just go ahead and type in your question on the questions box, um, and then we'll read them out loud um, in order. And um, we will provide the opportunity to ask questions. Um, so if you have any questions before uh, we ask for them, just go ahead and jot them down or send them to me. Um, and with that, oh, also, yes, everybody always asks, can we have the PowerPoint? Yes, you will get the PowerPoint. We will send it out with a link to the presentation today that you can either watch or you can forward to other people to watch. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists today. Um, we have Diane Storman, who's the Health Programs Manager from Exceptional Family Resource Center. We have Nancy Levine Anderson, who's a therapy consultant with California Children's Services. We have Patty Palomar, an occupational therapist from the North Coastal Con Consortium for Special Education. And we have Melissa Hader, a physical therapist uh, who's an independent contractor providing school-based services. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Diane. And welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Hi, everybody. Um, like Tara said, I'm Diane Storman from Exceptional Family Resource Center. And um, the reason we decided to put this particular webinar together is because at EFRC, we do get lots of questions about um, CCS, PT, and OT, as well as school district PT and OT, and uh, the various service models and, um, you know, why, why one might be recommended over another. And uh, we're lucky to have relationships with CCS and with the school districts. So I asked some of the providers if they'd be kind enough to come and share this information with all of us. And um, of course, we really appreciate it. And with that, I'll get the slideshow started. So um, the purpose of our session is, like I said, we just wanted to uh, get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, hear from the experts about how these decisions are made and, and what kind of um, considerations go into making a decision. Uh, Tara already talked about how to submit your uh, questions, and we just also wanted to point out that since we're in San Diego, um, the information we're going to share will be specific to how the system works here in San Diego and understanding that there may be slight variations in your part of the state. So if something isn't quite the way it works um, in your part of the state, of course, those questions can be directed to your CCS office or to your school district. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nancy Levine Anderson, who's going to talk um, about how eligibility decisions are made uh, for the services that are provided through the medical therapy program. Thank you, Nancy. Hi, all. Um, I think 
what I'd like to start with is describing California Children's Services and the two parts of the program, because I think frequently what gets confused and is confusing for those of us inside the system, let alone those who are trying to get into the system, um, are that we do have two parts to our program. One is the funding part, the financial eligibility part, um, where families do, or children do need to reach, uh, to meet medical eligibility criteria, but we are the case managers only, and um, once the child's determined to be medically eligible, then we would case manage only from a funding standpoint. Um, the other part of our program, which you are probably a lot more uh, aware of, is the medical therapy program, um, which there isn't necessarily a financial component. Now, there can be, but the biggest issue is medical eligibility and the ability to, once a child meets that eligibility, and we'll talk about that, um, that they may be eligible for occupational therapy, physical therapy, and uh, conference with the physicians at the individual medical therapy units. Um, now, both sides of the program cover children between birth and 21 years of age. The medical therapy part of the program tips covers two categories of children. Under the age of three would be a, ch a child who is at risk for developing um, typically cerebral palsy, but a medically eligible condition. And I'll talk about what those criteria are um, in a minute. The other part is for children who have specific eligible conditions that are neuromuscular or musculoskeletal um, in, in their foundation. And so our biggest categories of children are cerebral palsy, uh, children with muscle diseases, children with spinal disorders um, like spina bifida or spinal cord injuries. Um, however, there's many other kiddos who fall into that category depending upon what their physical findings, their clinical uh, findings are, how they present. Um, now for children who are in the at-risk area, there are five particular eligibility criteria. And a child under the age of three needs to meet at least two of them. So two out of the five criteria. Um, what those criteria are, are either, and some of them are um, difficult to understand, but I'll try to explain them, um, would be exaggeration or persistence of primitive reflexes. And primitive reflexes are those kinds of positions that uh, an infant is born with in order to protect themselves, make sure they can clear their airway, um, move their hands away from their faces, uh, that sort of thing. So a physician would need to document that. Um, increased deep tendon reflexes of three plus or greater. And if you can imagine when you're at the doctor and you have, you know, he's testing your reflexes, he or she, with a hammer against your knee, it would be counting the number of times that you bounce. Um, and ones that are suspicious are three plus or greater. Um, any kind of abnormal posturing, things that you wouldn't normally want to see um, or that you're concerned about, fisting of hands, um, you know, body parts that are pointed in the wrong direction or in different directions. Um, children under the age of one, if they're hypotonic and have increased DTRs, um, otherwise they need to have persistent reflexes and hypotonia and increased DTRs. And the other would be asymmetry, so that the, the arms work differently than the legs or the right side of the body works differently than the left side of the body. So under the age of three, a child would need to meet two out of the five of those criteria. 
Um, and again, you know, we make our determinations. Reports come to our, to our uh, admin office, and we're doing it by paper review. So we make our decisions based on physician medical reports, um, which is why we always, typically, we ask for orthopedic or neurology reports um, to get those specific clinical findings. And of course, some reports are more thorough than others, and some are written better than others and some um, we need to gather additional information in order to make a decision. Uh, for children over the age of three, they need to not only have a, a diagnosis for the medical therapy program that meets one of our areas, broad categories of coverage, but their clinical findings need to support that. So very often we will get medical reports um, that will, for example, say cerebral palsy, and then the only clinical finding that is clearly stated is hypotonia. Um, and you know, there are a lot of children who have issues with hypotonia and indeed need some level of intervention. But for CCS, for our state guidelines, um, hypotonia does not qualify on its own. It needs to be in combination with um, persistent primitive reflexes. So if, if hypotonia is the only clinical finding that's documented, it is probable that we will, uh, that child won't qualify unless there's some other suspicion that we're, we're seeing and then we would take it to a, a, another step. Um, anybody can refer. For us, we do make our decisions based on, our decisions for medical eligibility are based on medical reports by an MD, but absolutely anybody can, can make the referral. It can come from a school, it can come from a parent, it can come from the neighbor across the street or uh, anyone, any other interested individual. But the, the only way we, we can follow up on an app, or on a referral is if the legal guardian um, or the parent is the one who signs, who completes and signs an application for the medical therapy program. Um, can't be the foster parent, you know, it, it can't even be the primary caregiver um, unless that particular person has been um, court ordered to be the responsible legal guardian. Um, I hope that that kind of gives you an idea of what our referral process is and what our eligibility criteria is. Um, I believe later we'll talk about treatment recommendations and that uh, really is based a lot more on the individual needs of the child. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we'll move on then to uh, the occupational therapy and the physical therapy. And like Nancy said, we'll come back um, then to talk about treatment recommendations um, with the panel all together. Okay, next up is Patty Palomar. Um, Patty works currently for North Coastal Consortium for Special Education, but um, she came to work there through CCS, so she has a um, good knowledge of both systems. Uh, thank you, Patty. Hi. Um, it has been a joy both to work for CCS and to work for North Coastal Consortium for Special Education. Uh, it has been a, a wonderful experience to come to California about six years ago and find out the differences in the way services are rendered here for the um, special education students versus in other states. Uh, they don't have the privilege of having CCS there. Um, let me talk briefly about uh, how referrals are made. Uh, Melissa is also here at this phone, and um, so please, Melissa, interject at any time. Um, primarily for occupational therapy, and I'm just going to do some generalities first, uh, we usually get a referral in the school system 
uh, coming from the teachers in general, although parents can also make the referral. Uh, the primary reason for the referral is because they are not able to function in the classroom adequately. Now that may take, uh, that may be due to fine motor skills, that may be due to sensory processing problems, um, or other issues. At that point, um, if the child is already on, in special education and has an IEP, uh, then we would need to hold an IEP meeting to determine whether or not to go ahead with an OT assessment. Um, oftentimes, if the child is not special ed, they will do what is called an SSP meeting, uh, which is the student study team. And basically, that's a, a wonderful brainstorming time with the parents and the um, special ed and general ed staff, and if they have OT or PT questions, then we are also asked to attend the SSP. Um, at that time, we may give them some very general strategies to use in the classroom to assist in their performance in the educational system. If after a few weeks, usually it's six weeks, we come back together and reconvene the SSP, if those strategies either have been ineffective or there have become more issues, then oftentimes it results in a full psychoeducational assessment. Um, both OT and PT services uh, cannot be standalone services. We are related services. So if there are problems with handwriting, but the child is not eligible for special education, we cannot do an occupational or physical therapy evaluation because we are a related service. We are, it is extremely important that we stay related to the IEP goals and the areas of deficit that were found in the assessments that were done for the psychoeducational assessments. Um, when they have been found for special education, eligible for special education, and we have done an assessment, we reconvene and discuss results as a team to decide whether or not services would be prudent and helpful for the child. There are a variety of levels of service that we can render. Um, the simplest would be just giving some strategies to the teacher and uh, general ed and special ed teachers and to allow them to occasionally touch base with us on kind of a monitor status. Um, although because of at least Carlsbad's paperwork, we don't have a monitor status box, so they put us under consultation, but we are on an accommodations page for that because we are simply consulting with the teacher or the, the actual process of whatever they are trying to teach that student. Um, if the child needs a little more direct services, chances are we may do a monthly consultation or we may find that the child has significant deficits and need to have some direct services. We try to look at the least restrictive for the services. So uh, not pulling them out is always our first choice because the child is there. Their occupation is as a student. And so we want them to get the full amount of educational instruction that is possible. Um, So from that point, from the time that the child makes or becomes eligible for OT or PT, and I'm sorry if I'm saying a little bit of yours, Melissa, uh, but at that point, then they continue to have benchmarks or times where we relate and report the progress on the child. Usually that is on a quarterly basis in the school system. Uh, the difference, just because of, of coming also from a CCS background, uh, the difference that I see mainly working in schools 
is that we are very much connected to that educational process, to the curriculum and the educational expectations that are being placed on that child and how they're performing there. Um, if they are doing just fine, then they obviously don't need related services. Thank you, Patty. Yeah. Um, Melissa, would you like to speak? Sure. Um, this is uh, Melissa Heider, and I, I too work for the school districts. I'm an independent contractor within the North County school system. And as, as well as Patty, I started off at California Children's Services um, and then currently in the school system. And for the eligibility, the, the referrals are the same as OT. We get referrals from teachers, parents. Um, I get referrals from OT and also from Adapted PE as well. And from there, that's when I'll do an evaluation um, on each child, and I will look at how they are functioning in the school setting, whether or not it's ambulation walking around campus and being able to access their environment, sitting in the classroom chairs, being able to access their playground equipment, and uh, including the uh, bathrooming activities and lunchtime activities as well. And then based upon that, evaluation is when we will sit down as a team and discuss what type of goals um, are, would be helpful for this child to gain more function in the school setting. And also that would also drive the services, the goals will drive the services on to see whether or not the child will receive direct services or a consultative um, approach as well. Thank you. So next we wanted to look at um, how are decisions made about uh, what child will receive solely medical services through the MTU or which children might be receiving only the school-based uh, services and of course which children would be receiving both and kind of how the two systems interact uh, when, when that's the case, when a child is getting services through the MTU and through the school. Uh, district. So um, this is actually going to be led by the three panelists, um, Nancy and Patty and Melissa. Well, let me talk about the medical part of it first because our, our, the controversy really is whether the therapy needs to be medically based therapy or educationally based therapy. And sometimes there's a very clear line regarding that, and sometimes that line is uh, very blurry and very vague. Um, we are also considered a related service under the IEP process. However, what needs to happen is that our the goals that our therapists, after they do their e uh, evaluations, the goals will go to the IEP team, which obviously includes the family, the educators, and, and other related service uh, personnel. And at that point, it's determined whether the medical therapy goals are related to the classroom or the education um, curriculum for that child that's denoted in the uh, IEP. Um, and we may be listed as a related service. Um, and it gets difficult when some of the goals that we have also made, you know, also obviously we're talking about the IEP process, so there is some interrelationship between what's happening from a medical or scientific basis and what the expectation is in the classroom. Um, from our perspective, CCS's perspective, and from our directives from the state, what we do in order to compare if, if both levels of service are being discussed, by that I mean education and, and medical therapy, um, we look at the goals on the evaluation reports and the treatment plans. And based on the goals and the treatment plans and reviewing them from the CCS 
medical therapy program side and the education side, then individually we're looking at whether the child, um, uh, whether the recommendations are different. And if they're different, then um, obviously there's a need on both, on both ends. Um, if the goals are similar and if the treatment plans are similar, then there's a, a decision that needs to be made. And that usually um, would happen through the IEP team process. Um, sometimes it, it needs to go further than that. Um, but our deciding factor is related to having um, the medical director, the physician who is signing the prescription for medical therapy, we would ask him or her to review both reports, look at the goals and the treatment plans, and help us determine how the child will be best served. Thank you, Nancy. Um, Patty and Melissa, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, sure. Uh, some of the students that we see uh, receive both uh, CCS, OT, I, I'll speak just for OT right now, as well as educational OT, and um, we, are, we communicate with the CCS OT to make sure that our goals are not duplicated. Um, in general, uh, their goals tend to focus more on, for OT, on the self-care aspects and how that medical disability is preventing the child from being more independent in their self-care. Uh, and then at the school side, uh, I would be focusing more on how that disability is impacting their educational curriculum and is, are they able to copy from a board or do those kind of things, sit in the school chairs. Uh, but it would be more educationally related with the curriculum and a little less on the self-care aspect uh, in general. This is just in general. Um, that's been the way that, that the CCSOTs and myself have been able to not duplicate goals and have been able to complement each other in those areas. Uh, it seems to have worked very well that mm -hmm. way. And I had, I'd have to agree with that as well for the physical therapy side of it. Um, half of my case list is probably open to CCS for therapy. The other half um, is either another private-based um, PT practice or um, or they, it is it actually it is being paid privately for for somebody else, um, and based upon that, it's the same thing that we do talk to the the other PTs, determine what their goals are, and make sure that our goal, goals are not duplicated, so everybody's working on something different. Uh, and in the in the school setting, um, there are going to be pretty specific goals to what's on that child's campus and how they're going to be getting around, whether or not there's stairs or a ramp, um, and whether or not they are also in um, an adaptive classroom chair as well. So we do a lot of providing equipment um, within, the, within the classroom setting uh, for, for the children as well. And they do receive um, both services as well, CCS and school-based therapy. Great, thank you. So um, if, if a child is receiving CCS and an IEP is being opened or vice versa, if a child is receiving services through an IEP and a referral to CCS is made, are IEPs or are, are, um, would, would you guys get together and talk before the IEP or kind of what's the communication system for you guys? Uh, just in preparing for, for what services a child would get? Um, if the child is already open to CCS and is either being evaluated by myself or one of the other OTs in school, uh, oftentimes we'll just call the CCS, the medical therapy unit, and uh, 
talk with the OTs about that after a two-way release of information has been signed by the parent. Um, that is the best way to coordinate. Uh, we have also, again, with the parent's permission, sent reports back and forth so that we can make sure that the progress and the goals are aligned and complementary of each other. Uh, this has worked particularly well because, in general, the school OTs and PTs reevaluate every three years or at least update progress quarterly and then put new goals in place every year, whereas CCS reevaluates every six months. Or a year. Or a year. Or a year. Yeah. Um, so it, it has been very beneficial to have that communication with the CCS OTs for myself. Mm -hmm and for PT. And from our, our perspective, from the CCS perspective, um, we don't always know if education is involved. And that, that is you know, not a universal. That is district to district um, could be different, or the parent just got into both systems, and they're still trying to find their way around the system and aren't really sure that um, their family is involved in more than one agency. Um, but as if we know, and we've had the conversation with the family, I mean, our, our, our goal is to have our um, parents or caregivers at the, at the evaluations when we're doing them, whether they're initial evals or re -evals. And we would be talking with them about what we're seeing, what our goals are, um, and be talking about what other services that their child is receiving. So at that point, if we do know that um, education therapy is involved, we will try to get in touch with that person. Um, under our uh, federal regulations and state regulations that under HIPAA, as long as we are case managing on the same child and are mutually involved with the child, we don't necessarily need a separate um, exchange of information um, if it's an ongoing process. So we, in a way, have a bit easier time um, making contact, um, providing we know the people to make contact with. Um, and depending upon, you know, in, in San Diego County, we have uh, six special education local planning areas, and which, within those six SELPAs, we have um, many of those SELPAs have 10 or 13 school districts in them. And so they're all a little bit different, and they all provide educational therapy a little bit differently. So um, I don't want to say that it's it's clear across the board how we would get this communication going. Sometimes um, it's not done prior to the IEP meeting. I mean, sometimes it's done at the IEP meeting. Sometimes um, you know it comes up in conversation in in odd places. So um, all I can say is that our our goal is to have the conversation, but the timing of it. Uh, can vary. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how Exceptional Family Resource Center helps um, families who are receiving these services in San Diego. Uh, we're actually really lucky in that we are have a parent support contract with California Children's Services where we're able to go out and meet parents in the medical therapy unit and talk to them there. And a big side benefit to that has been getting to know the therapist and getting to understand CCS a little bit better so that when families do call us with questions, we have better ideas on where to direct them and um, what kind of information is going to be helpful and, and what they might be looking for. And we also have a contract with North Coast Consortium for Special Education, the, the um, 
we use the acronym NIPSI, and we also provide parent support there. So we're lucky in that it gives us some contacts we might not otherwise have, and we're able to direct families, kind of help them put their questions into work. And, and point them in the right direction. And um, the big thing I really want to point out is how much we appreciate the relationships with the professionals. And I want to take the time before we start questions and answers to thank Nancy and Patty and Melissa for their time because I suspect they gave up their lunch hour today to be with us. And um, we really do appreciate their expertise. Um, We're happy to be that, here. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. And Nancy, I also meant to apologize to you because I, I made a note to myself to say your name right and I said the theme <laughs> and it's Levine, so I apologize. Not a problem, but thank thanks. you. So um, we thought we would open it up to questions now and uh, Tara has talked a little bit about how you can get your questions in, so I think I'll uh, uh, hand it over to her and see if there's any questions coming yet and if not, I have a couple. Okay, hi guys. So um, if you have a microphone um, and or you're on the phone, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand, do the little hand function. If you don't, please send me your questions by typing them and then we'll read them out loud. Um, I have one question that's come in, but everybody else, please, uh, this is the time to ask those questions that um, you've got in the back of your mind. Um, one question from Julie, she wondered um, who pays for the equipment that was provided for an adaptive chair that you were talking about earlier? For the school districts, um, we have adapted classroom chairs that we can order, and it's through our low incidence money. Um, and every uh, July, the, the districts get a new budget, um, and uh, you can order chairs through the schools through the low incidence program. And as you know, long, yeah, as long as they qualify, sorry, as long as they qualify for special ed and they have it on an IEP, and it's either coming from the PT or the OT that they, they that they need a classroom chair to sit in instead of sitting in a regular classroom chair. Okay, great. Diane, were you going to say something? I was, I was going to say that actually dovetails with one of the questions I wanted to bring up is sometimes we get questions from parents about adaptive equipment that the child has at school and the possibility of bringing it home. And would that necessarily be something that could be written into the IEP? Or if the child were to need that kind of equipment at home, would that be something that they should ask CCS for? And um, what about the situations where a child gets um, services through school and not CCS? So um, that question actually comes up quite a bit. In my experience, the equipment that is ordered through low incidence has to stay at school and it does not go back and forth. Um, if they have, if they're open to CCS and they qualify for CCS, um, they can have certain equipment that is um, ordered, but it has to go through insurance. It has to be signed by their um, their doctor, by their orthopedic. So it has to be something they medically nece or nece ne medically ne need necessary. Uh, whether or not it's a walker or a gait trainer, adapted. Um, Chairs are not usually funded through insurance, um, and if a, if I have a parent who asks me about the adaptive chairs or seating systems for home, um, I do show them what I've ordered, I, and they are more than welcome to find other resources to pay for it, um, and they, um, they order it them on their own basically if, if, if it's specifically um, a chair. The, the reason why the equipment stays at school is, is basically for liability issues. Great. Th thank you. So, and on um, the CCS, Nancy, I'm sorry? No, on no the, please. Uh, on the CCS side of things, um, when we're involved in the purchase of equipment for children. First of all, they need to be financially eligible either, as Melissa said, through their private insurance or through CCS um, and we manage Medi-Cal funding and also 
um, have straight CCS backup. Um, but the equipment, as also Melissa said, needs to be medically necessary and has to be for a particular purpose that's going to um, assist the child in a particular endeavor of, of some level of independence um, or health and safety. So, and again, the child that the children that we would purchase or be involved in the purchasing process of equipment, um, that piece of equipment can go back and forth to school. However, like we're talking wheelchairs or walkers, um, we wouldn't necessarily, if, if for some reason a stander, for example, was medically necessary for a child at home for a particular reason, um, that wouldn't be something that would be transported back and forth to both locations. Um, there are times when a piece of equipment in the classroom is recommended, for example, a stander, um, and that piece of equipment can't go back and forth, but is also uh, medically indicated for home, and then um, CCS would be involved in, in the purchase of one for home while the school district would be involved in getting one into the classroom. Perfect. Thank you so much. OK, we have um, some more questions that have come in. Um, Kristen asks, can you give an example of PT goals that would be entirely educational in nature and a complementary goal that would be entirely medical in nature that would not possibly overlap and allow for both services to be involved? I have problems finding goals that work, uh, since even though school goals might be specific to campus, uh, PTs have written goals that mirror the skill or activity, which means there's a duplication. Yeah, I'm going to leave that for Melissa. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, welcome. <laughs> I have the same problem. There, if, and I do have to look at it, you know, in getting the, the CCS report and looking at the goals. So if the medical goal is that the child's going to ambulate on even and uneven surfaces for 100 feet independently, um, they, you know, you have to be very careful in um, measuring it by a, a length of time or distance and the need of assistance, whether or not it's independent contact guard assist, minimal assist, et cetera. So from that type of a goal, if it's just an independent ambulation, my goal is going to be a little bit different and, and more on the campus, that um, the child is going to be able to ambulate on, on school grounds on even and uneven surfaces to, to four different areas on campus independently. So if it's a child who is more independent um, and can verbally um, have directions, then they're going to be able to go to the lunch table by themselves. They're going to be able to go over to the playground by themselves because we're trying to get them more independent onto more of like a middle school age that they can go to these four different places safely um, without tripping or falling or losing their balance and be able to remember where it is on campus that they need to go to. Um, and that would be more of a uh, ambulation goal. And with that, the rest of the team um, will be able to help implement that. So whether or not they're with an aide, with the teacher, the OT, and they will help with it throughout the whole school day and every day of the week as well. Um, because I won't be able to be there every day directing that one goal. If it's a goal where um, CCS has medically said that they will be able to perform floor to stand 10 times uh, while holding an object in their hand, and that goal is actually to increase their quad strength, then I can take that goal and say, okay, they're weak in their quads. What am I going to do at school to help? They're doing floor to stand. I'm going to do something different. And as preschoolers, I can say that I can get them to be able to ride a tricycle if they're not riding a tricycle. And that will help them um, increase their quad strength. And so that they can ride their tri tricycle around um, the track two times 
independently or even with contact guard assist so they can continue to help steer. So there's two, two different kinds of goals that, that I can give examples. If you need more, I could come up with more, but that's more of a preschool goal and then more of an older elementary child who's going to be going into middle, middle school soon. So Chris, thanks. Uh, Kristen follows up and asks, so it seems like you're working on ambulation and the CCSPT is also working on ambulation, so isn't that essentially the same thing? They are, however, I, I, the, on, on my side, for the school side for the ambulation, it, they both are working on ambulation, but, but one of them, for my side, it is that they know their directionality, they know, they've memorized where their campus is, um, they can take a, a one verbal step command and be able to go to four different areas. I can even give them a two-step command of, or not myself, it could be the teacher, you know, take the attendance to the office and then go to the cafeteria and hand off the, the what everybody wants for lunch. So you have the freedom to expand on it and that's when it becomes more of an educational goal because you can put extra steps in there, um, following the directions, knowing where they're, where all the items are in campus and also being able to get back and forth in a timely manner. So you can put a time frame on that because that's going to become important in middle school. They might be able to ambulate 150 feet in five minutes but in order to do that as when the bell rings with the rest of the children and maneuver on your campus and get that functional mobility um, and not you know follow follow the traffic of the school pattern so it, it, it's a one step closer for them to be able to function with the rest of the school great thank you um, there's some, a question from Michelle related to that um, says, could the ambulation goals be set up by PT and carried out by school personnel? Yes. It, 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 you mean it, set up by the CCF PT? I think that's what they mean. Not positive. It, it's two, it would be two different evaluations. If, if it was CCS who has the goal of the ambulation and um, they do not have PT on their services at the school site, um, a PT should still, in the school setting, still have an evaluation completed and can still be put on a uh, consultative model if it's, if it's, a, if it's a simple um, goal as, as ambulating. And the CCS therapist would then be involved with um meeting with the classroom teacher or whomever is in the classroom so that it's a classroom program that's set up for that so that the child is getting um, practice, it's becoming part of their, their normal daily routine. Okay, great. Um, we have a question from Antonisha who asks, what advice would you give parents whose child needs adaptive equipment but the school doesn't have the funds to pay for this need um, even though it's in the child's IEP um, and the family's insurance won't cover it? Um, my suggestion, there are a, a lot of private funding agencies out there, mm -hmm. um, philanthropic resources, mm -hmm. fraternal organizations, um, mm -hmm. where you can go to them and see they, you know, very frequently will uh, fund equipment for you. Yeah. Um, many times I think, and Melissa and Patty, you can chime in on this, but I think the school districts have equipment, not all of them, um, and it varies at school sites and in districts. But mm -hmm. there are there is equipment available. It just may not be you know the absolute newest that's the newest model that's in the catalog. But um, most of the time over the years, low incidence funds has been used to purchase a lot of equipment, um, and it may be available. It's just takes some digging to find it and some. Uh, willingness on all sides to 
to use perhaps a piece of equipment that isn't um, purchased brand new. That's that's true, Nancy. Um, e each school district has basically a, a storage area for all their equipment that they have been ordering over the years. Um, and we do take bits and pieces of it to make um, the equipment work for the child. If there is something that they need and they need it specifically in their size, whether or not it be a stander or a gate trainer, and I don't have any extras, then I do have to put in um, through low incidence to, to buy that piece of equipment. Um, you know, our, our fiscal year starts in July, so I, I try to make sure that I have a list of things that I know are going to be coming up. And come May, I won't be able to necessarily order that, that piece of equipment, but I can find it in different schools. And um, Patty? The other thing with low incidence funds is that when that is bought for the child, like let's say a standard, it is that it is basically assigned to that child until either they can no, no longer need it, no longer fit it, or whatever. But it goes with the child throughout their school years until they no longer need it. Uh, so it's basically bought for that specific child. OK, great. Um, Julie asks, does CCS and education ever combine funding for such things as adapted computer devices or communication devices? And can these go between home and school? Uh, we do for communication devices in the sense that uh, Nixie has two wonderful assistive technology people. Um, and if, if the, uh, either CCS or the um, school therapists are seeing that there needs to be a communication device, then there are funds, uh, as Nancy was kind enough to talk about at the beginning of her, her talk, that CCS really has two different parts. And one of those parts is the financial aspect. And Nancy, if you want to speak to that more? Um, when I think we're dealing with a, a couple of different issues here. Typically, we don't share monies between school district and CCS. Um, we share expertise with, um, we, with staffing. For example, if we wanted to get an augmentative communication device, a speech device, um, and the family was financially eligible, CCS could very well be the funding source for that augmentative communication device. But prior to it being pursued or purchased through us, we would want um, the OTs who are involved, the OT or OTs that are involved with the child and the PT or PTs to determine um, access and use. And we would want the speech therapist who's involved with the child um, to initiate a, a, an eva a speech evaluation and a protocol for determining what device is the best one to use. Now, there's, there's also the opportunity to share, for example, with Nixie, they have some devices that can be tried or, or trialed. So CCS wouldn't necessarily have to pay for a trial because a device or devices are available to, um, to try out and see which ones meet the child's needs. Um, and then purchase can happen, can happen later. But the ability to mix education funds with um, Department of Health or CCS funds for the purpose of purchasing one device that can be brought to all uh, environments, we can't mix up pots of money. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, let's, unless the presenters have anything more to add to that, I'll do one more question. OK. Um, there's one more question from Elma. Um, she says, do the special education teachers or school follow through with standing programs as established by the CCS physical therapist? Under what circumstances can the teachers or school refuse to carry out a student's standing program? 
Well, they definitely um, go through with the programs. Um, and as I've gone and visited a lot, a lot of the schools, I do see the CCS uh, classroom programs taped up on the wall. Um, so I, I, I do see that often. Um, and um, it, it's followed through. I think that the advice would be um, for a parent to go to and the, when they go to the IEP that they can ask, you know, CCS can attend the IEP and bring that piece of paper and it can be written into the IEP. Uh, if something's not written into an IEP and it's specifically, it needs to specifically say in the IEP that this child needs to be standing in the stander or at a supportive surface X amount of days for X amount of time um, because this is going to help him out whether or not it's for his bone density or stretching um, to be at eye level of the other children in the classroom. So it, it, that would be my advice is that it, it, it needs to be put inside an IEP for it to, to happen. I agree with that. And if for whatever reason, the, teach, the educational staff uh, is unable to fulfill that, then we need to re-meet in another IEP meeting, reconvene that IEP, and say, address what problems and why either that particular teacher doesn't feel comfortable doing mm -hmm. it or what the problems are. But, but we fully support that those mm -hmm. programs be implemented. If it's a child who does not have school-based physical therapy and that's something that's not available, um, the, the teachers and the aides need to be trained by the, the PT at CCS. So Correct. they would come out and they would teach them how to transfer and how to stand up. So that, I mean, that, that's definitely something that, that has to be done on, on both sides for the liability of, of the student and the staff. Correct. Great, thank you. I think you. you're oh, right sorry. that, that the, um, the safety net in all of that is, is making sure that it, uh, the program, the standing program is written into the IEP um, so that the expectations are clear on, on all sides. We have been involved in situations where, um, you know, the training has happened, the program's been initiated, and indeed it's in the IEP but there's resistance because of um, safety issues. You know, you need two or three people to get that child into a standard. Um, mm -hmm. And the staffing doesn't allow. But I, I also agree with, with Patty that when things like that, when it falls apart, when, the, when a goal in the IEP isn't being met and there, there's concern about that, and rightfully so, then the IEP should be reconvened and the, the issue needs to be addressed and some form of resolution needs to come out of it. Great. Well, thank you so much um, to everybody, all the presenters today, Diane, Nancy, Patty, Melissa. Um, this has been really great. We haven't really had a panel like this before, but it's so wonderful to have um, the different pieces of the puzzle together. <laughs> um, and to everybody out there, as a follow-up to today's call, you're going to receive a survey by email, so please take the time to complete it. Um, and if you're not already on our listserv uh, to find out about upcoming trainings and opportunities, actions, action alerts, and, and more, um, please join. Um, and if you have any questions, you can contact us at Family Voices California. Um, next month's webinar, uh, we're going to talk more about uh, California Children's Services um, and how to integrate CCS with other health plans uh, with Sue Johnson and Terry Enns from CCS. Uh, and that's on November 3rd at noon. Um, and uh, as a follow-up to today's call, everybody will get an email from me uh, with a link to where you can download the presentation and the PowerPoint point and all that. Um, so thank you so much to our presenters. Thank you so much thank for you. the opportunity. You're welcome, and it was my pleasure. Thank and you. And I just wanted to throw out, you know, I kind of felt a little bit like a poser because you three are really the experts, and I wanted to let you know I learned a lot today. So thank you. Great.
Thank you. All right. Okay. Terrific. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Bye now. Bye. Bye.